Why don't we stone persons who engage in homosexual practice, or for that matter, adultery? Or for that matter, a person who engages in sex with a parent, or a child, or sibling? So at root here, again with the woman caught in adultery, at root here is the issue of what love means. A sex is not just more intimacy, it's about merger. It's about reuniting constituent parts. WWJD, what would Jesus do? I have no clue. I don't have a single Jesus saying on incest, let alone my mother incest. Welcome to Pure Passion. My name is Jason Graves and I'm your host for today's program. We have a tremendous testimony for you today. Dr. Robert Gagnon is Associate Professor of New Testament at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary and the author of arguably the best book ever written by any scholar on what the Bible teaches about homosexual behavior. We're going to be asking Dr. Gagnon the hard questions, the ones most believers don't know how to answer. Every believer needs to see this program. We're ill-equipped to respond to gay apologists who have honed their theological arguments to a fine edge. The truth is, they have no scriptural or historical ground to stand on, but they are very good at sounding as though they do. Dr. Gagnon will help us pierce through that darkness with the truth found in God's Word. Let's listen in. A key way, of course, to distinguish between uh, what law is merely uh, civil or a ritual or moral is to look what the New Testament authors do with it. Uh, but it's also even to look within the Old Testament uh, text itself and to look what the authors do with that, because there are ver varying degrees of penalties that take place, which itself is sort of an indication. A uh, degree to which any offense uh, is pervasively prescribed, uh, is absolutely prescribed, uh, is uh, strongly prescribed, and counterculturally prescribed. These are all ways of looking at an offense to see you know, is this, this a core value of sexual ethics here or any form of ethics? Or is this attained more to a more superficial level of ritual purity? You know, I, I have two young children, and it's amazing. Even though they, they haven't even entered junior high school yet, they know when mommy and daddy really mean something. They don't have to have a Ph.D. to know that. They know that there are some rules that mommy and daddy have, that, especially with daddy, because I have two daughters, they can really get daddy to bend them quite a lot. But they also know that there are certain rules that mommy and daddy will never bend on. Now, how do they, how do, they do that? Just little children. All little children are capable of doing this. They know it because people are able to intuit certain cues that they received from an authority figure as to whether or not this is a foundational issue or not. And we, we find that same sort of thing running through both testaments. If value is held pervasively, it's held strongly, it's held absolutely without exceptions, and it's held counterculturally. Very little doubt that this is an area of significance. It's a core value within the text. So, for example, some people will look in Leviticus and they'll talk about mixing two different kinds of cloth. Maybe that's what this is like. Or mixing two different kinds of seed. Maybe that's what this is like. And compare that as an offense which shouldn't be any big deal anymore. But when you look at those kinds of commandments, they don't bear the same kind of pervasive, absolutely strongly held countercultural kind of element that we find with these other sex offenses. In fact, for example, when we look at cloth mixtures, Israel is allowed cloth mixtures in certain occurrences. Where do cloth mixtures appear? They appear in the tabernacle cloths. They appear in the single tassel that the laity is able to wear. It's a symbolic reference to holiness, that we are held apart from the surrounding culture and, and we identify and mix only in the divine realm. And we keep separate from the human, secular, profane realm. So they allow those kinds of exceptions because it's clearly presented as a symbolic element. In Deuteronomy, with regard to the two kinds of seeds, what happens if you sow a field with two different kinds of seed? Capital sentencing? Nothing like it. The crop gets destroyed. That's it. What happens to the garment? The garment gets destroyed. That's it. That's very different from what happens if you attempt to merge with somebody who's too much of a structurally same, like your mother, 
like your child, like your sibling, or if you merge with somebody of the same sex. Nobody's ever said, gee, we got incest law. Because that occurs in Levitical Holiness Code, that must be very much like mixing two different kinds of seed or mixing two different kinds of cloth. Never heard that argument, that analogy be used. Because people intuit there's a very clear difference between a symbolic element here, for which exceptions are clearly made, and another case of sexual offense, which is regarded as a first-tier sexual offense, for which no exceptions are ever made, for which the greatest and gravest of penalties is applied, and which is clearly carried over into the New Testament. We know that the elements of cloth mixtures, seed mixtures, are not carried over in the New Testament. They're regarded as having just symbolic, primary symbolic value. Why don't we stone persons who engage in homosexual practice, or for that matter, adultery, or for that matter, a person who engages in sex with a parent or a child or sibling? Um, well, we have a good reason for that in Jesus' story about the woman caught in adultery. Uh, does Jesus think, because he uh, tells people not to stone the woman who's caught in adultery, does Jesus think that adultery is a minor offense now? I would say he doesn't. In fact, I would argue that because Jesus regards adultery as a major offense of the highest order, he takes the approach that he does with regard to the crown. What would be the problem if the crowd stones the woman caught in adultery? The problem is dead people don't repent. And Jesus knows that what is at stake here is something more than simply a civil sentencing in this life. What is at stake here is the entire kingdom of God that he's been proclaiming to people. And so, if you stone this woman who's caught in adultery, what possibility is there now for reclaiming her for the kingdom of God? No possibility. But what does Jesus tell the woman at the end? And no, and no longer be sinning. And it's very interesting that that particular phrase should be used because the exact same phrase appears earlier in John 5. Only other place. And there it's followed up immediately by Jesus' statement, lest something worse happen to you. So the implication that Jesus is giving, there's something worse than being stoned in this life. And the something worse is being excluded from God's eternal presence. And I'm going to give you now every possible opportunity to be reclaimed for God's kingdom. And that's why we don't stone people. Not because we don't regard the sexual offenses any more as significant, but because everything is at stake. That's why it's not at all surprising when Paul, who's a good disciple of Jesus, when he talks about the case of the incestuous man in 1 Corinthians 5, and what does the church at Corinth do? They, they pride themselves in their ability to tolerate what this man is doing. What Paul says to them is, you should rather have mourned. Why should they have mourned? Because this individual's life is at stake. And they are doing nothing to rescue him. Now, by our standards, we would say, oh, it's the people who are tolerant of his behavior who are the loving ones. But we know, looking back, the only one who really loved this man was Paul. Because he was willing to do what needed to be done to recover him for the kingdom. And that's why when we move from 1 Corinthians 5 to 1 Corinthians 6, Paul gives a vice list at the end of 1 Corinthians 5. Any of the following groups of offenders, don't associate with them because they will not inherit the kingdom. Don't associate with them. He says, well, why not associate with them? Same set of vices reappear in chapter 6, verses 9 to 10. The only difference is Paul adds a few other sex vices to fill out what he means by the pornoi, the sexually immoral persons. He's already declared the incestuous man to be a pornos, a sexually immoral person. And he expands on the meaning of that in the vice list in 1 Corinthians 6. And at the end of it, he says, such people, will, which you used to be, but you're no longer, such people will not inherit the kingdom of God. So he says, don't deceive yourselves. Now, he's dealing with the case of a professed Christian. And the potential on his part and the part of the community who's approving what he's doing is they deceive themselves. What do they deceive themselves? They deceive themselves that he could do this action in a serial, unrepentant way and get away with it. Dr. Robert Gagnon taught a four lecture series for us entitled Love, the Bible, and Homosexual Practice that we have on CD and DVD. For those who were at the conference, the word that most often came to mind was exceptional. 
Although I have been trained by some of the finest theologians in the world, I have never heard anything as excellent and thoroughly grounded in Scripture on the topic of homosexuality as I heard from Dr. Gagnon. Without a doubt, you will want to have this set of CDs or DVDs in your library. Dr. Gagnon is so good in this area of study that he finds it almost impossible to find anyone from the gay activist side who will debate him. He's that good and he's that called of God for this hour and for this message. To obtain the CD or DVD series, Love the Bible and Homosexual Practice, go to purepassion.us. And while you're there, pick up a copy of Dr. Gagnon's definitive book on homosexuality entitled The Bible and Homosexual Practice. Just go to purepassion.us. Paul, when he does the same thing in Galatians 5, same kind of vice list, first three sets of vices, sexual offenses. Those who engage in porneia, sexual immorality. Those who engage in um, akathasia, sexual impurity or uncleanness. Those who engage in asogeia, sexual licentiousness, lack of sexual self-restraint with respect to the commands of God. All these are basically repeating themselves, looking at sexual sin from different angles. First three vices, sex. And when Paul finishes the vice list, he says, those who engage in this behavior won't inherit the kingdom of God, so stop deceiving yourselves. And again, the deception is thinking I could engage in it and get away with it. So really, what is love here? Why don't we stone people? Because everything is at stake. And love is about recovering people for the kingdom of God, not consigning them to hell. The irony is here, it's actually those who are tolerating the serial unrepentant sexual immorality that are consigning the individual to hell. And no matter what they feel affectively in themselves, functionally, it turns out to be hate. If person has two young children, and those young children want to touch a hot stove, and the parent says, there, there, knock yourself out, go ahead and explore, those parents are not considered loving. In fact, state social services takes the children out of the home, and the parents go to prison. So clearly, tolerance is not always loving. The issue that has to be faced here with regard to homosexual practice is first the truth question. Are people genuinely at risk? in their relationship to God through serial unrepentant behavior, not only of this sort, but of course other sexual offenses that we could bring out as well. And if the answer to that question is yes, they are at risk, then what does love mean in that context? Clearly, once that truth question is asked, love cannot mean perpetuating the behavior in, cre- in question with the fewest negative side effects. Love must mean ending the cycle of behavior lest the individual not inherit God's kingdom. So at root here, again with the woman caught in adultery, at root here is the issue of what love means. The Pharisees, they looked at Jesus. They could not get their theological imaginations around the notion that Jesus could both actively intensify God's ethical demand in our lives, on the one hand, and on the other hand, reach out aggressively in love to the biggest violators of that intensified ethic. They concluded if Jesus is reaching out aggressively in love to the violators of that ethic, that he must not be stressing the ethic. Because they're stressing the ethic and they want to have nothing to do with the violators. But Jesus is aggressively reaching out in love, fraternizing, inviting himself into their homes, eating with them, preaching the kingdom of God, focusing his ministry mostly on them for the very express purpose of recovering them for the kingdom. Where others didn't care that they were drowning, Jesus cared. And he reached out aggressively in love to bring them. Pharisees couldn't put those two together. How can you love and at the same time follow God's intensified ethic? Jesus said those two go together beautifully because it's precisely because of God's intensified ethic people are put at risk if they don't obey it. And we want as many as people as possible to inherit God's kingdom. So we ought to integrate those two in the church and not try to separate them. Well, love is certainly more than feelings and hormones, and uh, love is also distinct in its generic usage and its sexual usage, uh, that there are certain requirements and certain parameters for sexual relationships that don't attend to non-sexual relationships because sex is not just more intimacy. It's about merger. It's about reuniting constituent parts, in this case, male and female. And that has with it a whole set of parameters 
that it has to be a male and a female as sexual counterparts, sexual complements. It has to be restricted to two because we brought together the only two parties in the sexual spectrum, male and female. It, it must be a certain amount of structural um, difference uh, while still being complementary. Again, the analog of incest we reject on the basis of trying to pair two persons who are too much structurally alike, that there's a set of parameters that involve with sexual unions that don't involve merely because two people have a wonderful, nice, warm feeling about each other. There are other requirements in place. Many people do argue that the silence of Jesus, you know, as, or as I like to rephrase it, the silence of the Lamb. Um, how do we look at that? Well, uh, Jesus, interestingly enough, he never said anything about incest, including uh, man-mother incest, for example. And yet, when Paul dealt with the case of incest in Corinth, he didn't go, WWJD, what would Jesus do? I have no clue. I don't have a single Jesus saying on incest, let alone man-mother incest. I know, let's set up a denominational task force, and we'll look at it and talk about it. You give some ground, we'll give some ground, we'll find a middle way somewhere. He never had to say that. He simply said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, take the following action. Now, how did he come to that conclusion? Because Scripture's view on the subject of incest, certainly man-mother incest, which is considered in Leviticus 20 in the first tier of sexual offenses, is regarded as a egregious offense, pervasively prescribed in the uh, Scripture, strongly prescribed, absolutely prescribed, no exceptions are made, any place, for incest with your parent. doesn't matter whether you're adult, committed, you intend it to be long-term and loving. All that is totally irrelevant because you haven't met the formal or structural prerequisites that establish the relationship to begin with. So Paul knew exactly what Jesus' view was in the absence of any Jesus saying. He also took Jesus' same approach to the issue of polyamory, multiple partner sexuality. So when Paul Cites Romans 124 to 127. He echoes Genesis 126 to 127. We see he talks about humans being made in God's image and likeness. And then he talks about the three different animal gr groups uh, of birds, fish, and reptiles, and four footed beasts, he talks about. And then he talks about male and female. We have eight points of correspondence in the matter of a couple of verses and two sets of texts, which is what the Bible scholars now call intertextual echoes. He doesn't have to cite Genesis 1. He simply creates an echo chamber of meaning in a very short compass of text. So in the background of Paul's prescription is Genesis 1.27. And when he talks about uh, men lying with males in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, what does he have in the background there? Later on, within a few sets of verses, he cites Genesis 2.24. So very interesting, the same two texts which Jesus regards as normative and prescriptive with proscriptive implications for all manners of human sexual ethics are the very same two texts that Paul takes and then applies to his rejection of homosexual practice. One of the finest teaching resources that we have here at Pure Passion is a four lecture series by Dr. Robert Gagnon titled Love, the Bible, and Homosexual Practice. In his presentation, Dr. Gagnon explores one of the most important and contested issues in the church today. If two people of the same sex love each other, is this enough to justify a marriage? How should the Christian principle of love inform our response? Does the Bible teach that Jesus would have opposed committed homosexual relationships? Did the Apostle Paul oppose homosexual behavior only when it involves slaves, prostitution, and other exploitive practices? Does the Old Testament culture provide a consistent witness against homosexual practice? What do modern understandings of nature and science teach us? And how can we best minister to persons with same gender attractions? To obtain the series Love, the Bible, and Homosexual Practice on CD or DVD, just go to purepassion.us. That's purepassion.us. Jesus didn't have to talk explicitly about homosexual practice. He presumed as the foundation for his utterance about marital monogamy and indissolubility, the two-ness of the sexes at the very beginning. Without that foundation of the two-ness of the sexes, he could not have reached his limitation of sexual intercourse to two persons. So the foundation, of course, must be more important than the structure that's built on it.
what Jesus did take, and incidentally, there's no dissenting opinion in early Judaism. We have no record anywhere within centuries of the life of Jesus of any Jew engaged in homosexual practice. In fact, when they had what we called Noahide laws, even the forms of, uh, of, of moral commandments that would be incumbent even on non-Jews, always at the top of the list were sexual offenses, and always at the top of the list of sexual offenses was the issue of not engaging in homosexual practice. There's no dissenting opinion anywhere in Judaism on this subject. It's regarded as one of the most severe offenses. So Jesus, it would have been ridiculous for Jesus going around in first century Palestine and saying, you men stop having sex with other men, you women stop having sex with other women. They would say, who's doing that? Nobody's questioning it. We all know that there's a, a very strong rejection of it in the Hebrew scriptures. So let's move on to another subject. What he did do is take the only remaining loopholes that existed in his current cultural environment in Palestine and close those on the basis of a foundation of a two sexes prerequisite. So when we get Paul moving into a Gentile environment, he can no longer presume the fact that Gentiles know that this is wrong. In fact, he has to presume the exact opposite. Jesus is doing exactly what Jesus would have done in a Gentile context. When Paul talks about um, homosexual practice and the viceless in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, uh, he uses two sets of terms. One is malakoi, which means uh, the soft men. Uh, we actually have some parallel. Uh, the parallel term uh, in uh, Latin would be malus, also the soft men. And uh, sometimes it's simply transliterated into the Latin from the Greek as a way of showing continuing Roman aversion to it. it it's a term that could have both wide valence and specific use. Uh, in the context here, it definitely has specific use, which is a reference to men who effeminate themselves to attract male sex partners. And it's actually primarily used in a Greco-Roman context, not for boys or youths, but rather for adult men, who usually are thought of as having a biologically predisposing condition, in effect, an orientation. Most of the orientation theory that exists in uh, Greco-Roman material of the period, from, from moralists, from um, from medical doctors, except from scientists, so-called from the period, uh, happens to apply to these figures, the Malakoi. So when people say, well, but what if it's with men and they have an orientation, that's exactly that kind of figure we're talking about when we're looking at the soft men, the Malakoi, men who effeminate themselves to attract male sex partners. Now the other term, very distinctive term, arsenokoitai, is distinctive because it's formulated out of the Septuagint or Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it's drawn from two terms, arsen, meaning male, and koite, meaning lying, not in the sense of telling a falsehood, but lying in the sense of lying down with, having sexual intercourse with. And it's formulated from the Greek of the Levitical prohibitions of man-male intercourse. Uh, you shall not lie with a male uh, in uh, the Greek, right? Arsen, sakur, uh, sakai, actually in Hebrew, sakur in later Hebrew or uh, Aramaic, um, <clears throat> we'll see a parallel Hebrew term in a moment, and then uh, the term for, for lying, uh, koite in Greek. So they simply put the two together, lying and male. The prefix is actually the object. There's many uh, words where arson as a prefix male turns out to actually be the object of the implied verb of the following compound element. Sorry to get too technical there. Pardon that. Skip over that if that's a problem. Um, and it's formulated directly from the Levitical prohibitions, and we find it for the first seven or eight centuries only in Jewish and Christian texts. It's not a word that we see in the Greco-Roman context, in a non-Jewish, non-Christian context. And the reason why is, again, it's formulated from the Levitical prohibitions. We have a parallel, the parallel Hebrew phrase, uh, which is now the abstract term, lying with a male, mishkav zakor, is likewise formulated from these prohibitions, now obviously again from the Hebrew text. So we find in uh, the Talmud, in Tractate Sanhedrin, when it refers to a man lying with a male, it refers to this phrase, mishkav zakor. And incidentally, it makes a point in this very context that the male with whom the man lies can be either a boy or an adult male. So they're clearly not restricting their prescription in the context of early Judaism only to pederasty, but they mean it to be held universally. 
And when Jews and Christians use this specific term, they use it and not another term. There are many other terms that they could have used, including pederast, including men who are mad after males, and so on and so forth. There are many different terms that are used. They use a specific term formulated out of Levitical context as a way of saying the prohibition that we have of man-male intercourse is absolute and it's strongly held. The term isonokoitai, men who lie with a male, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, is formulated from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible of the prohibition of a man lying with a male in Leviticus 18, 22, and 2013. Uh, early Jewish rabbinic texts also formulate from the Hebrew mishkav sakur, which also means lying with a male, and is formulated from the Hebrew text of Leviticus 18, 22, and 2013. They formulate a special term for men who lie with a male from the Levitical context as a way of saying that our prohibition of man-male intercourse is absolute, no exceptions, unlike what we find in a Greco-Roman context. Exceptions exist there, but not for us. And we feel very strongly about this because you can see the prohibition and the penalty for it in Leviticus 20. It's a way of setting their own view of man-male intercourse out from the rest of the cultural environment. We're not going to make any exceptions for boys. We're not going to make any exceptions for slaves. We're not going to make any exceptions for foreigners. We're not going to make any exceptions for consensual unions. We're not going to make any exceptions for committed unions. There's something distinct and special about the way in which men image God and about the way in which women image God. Uh, They're both, in a sense, fully created in God's image, just as any individual is made, in one sense, fully in God's image. But we also know, we go to a church, for example, we see a much fuller representation than that full image that we see in any individual. And of course, when we look at Jesus, we get the fullest representation of God's image of all. So when we say that a, a, a man represents God's image in a way that a woman doesn't and vice versa, it's not, to, it's not to say anything negative or to say we're only half made in God's image because we are full, men are fully in God's image as male and women are fully in God's image as female. But it's a sort of angular expression of that image. That is looking at God from a particular angle. There, there are ways in which men excel and ways in which women excel. And uh, to, to try to compromise that, in a sense, by engaging in a same-sex uh, homoerotic relationship is dishonoring that particular angular representation of who God is and trying to be somebody that God has not intended us to be. I know you're going to want to see this program again. Perhaps show it in your small group or Sunday school class at church, or maybe even give a copy to that homosexual friend of yours. It's available on DVD in the online store of our website. Just go to purepassion.us. You know, for thousands of years, the Word of God has stood soundly and securely on three pillars of truth regarding this issue. Number one, homosexual behavior is a sin. Number two, God loves homosexuals just as much as anyone. Number three, he came to set free those entrapped by homosexuality. Thank you for caring enough about homosexuals that you took the time to become equipped to more redemptively minister to them. Until next week, I'm Jason Graves for Pure Passion, praying that God will use this week to help set the captives free. (laughs) 